the jokes, okay? <laughs> With appearances on the footy show, Sunrise, Pack to the Rafters, 20 to 1, Ready Steady Cook, Stand Up Australia, and many more, he's become a favourite headliner in the Australian comedy scene. In 2006, however, he was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, and within two years could barely walk, with pain crippling 80% of his body. After surgery and medications failed him, Clint went back to his science roots, which in 2000 saw him gain first class honours, uh, the Macquarie Foundation Science Prize, Australian Institute of Physics Prize, New South Wales branch, and semi-finalist semi for the Young Australian of the Year. With bulldog determination, persistence, and scientific experimentation, Clint turned his health around and now leads a life drug-free and pain-free. He's now an ambassador for Arthritis uh, New South Wales and is author of the best-selling online program, The Patterns and Program for Rheumatoid Arthritis, which has sold in over 30 countries and has dramatically improved the lives of hundreds of people with RA. So please uh, welcome Clint as he talks to us about pain-free, drug-free and back to maximum energy. Thank you, Mark Paul. All right. Appreciate it. Oh uh, yeah, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. In very unusual circumstances, uh, I've been, uh, as you know, hosting the uh, the awards night, like the one we got tonight, um, every year for the last. This will be my fourth year, so I'm really blessed to be able to be a part of this group, and I feel a great synergy, almost like a family, with some of the people I've met naturopaths through this group and so forth. But today I'm here during this uh, day session to talk about something that's uh, far less funny. So I'm sorry if I'm going to disappoint a little bit, but we haven't got a ton of humour in this because it's rheumatoid arthritis. So uh, it's kind of the least funny of the diseases. Um, in fact, uh, it's one of those crippling things that uh, most people don't even want to talk about with their family or, or share with friends. It's a very private disease. But I've had a very interesting and unusual story um, with regards to my rheumatoid arthritis that I want to share with you today. So let's get started because I've got a lot to cover and I know I'm the last session so I don't want to run over. So let's get stuck right into it. Alright, so if we could see if this uh, little clicker moves us along. Here we go. Okay, rheumatoid arthritis. Why does this matter? Why do we care about this? Well, we're on the health and wellness business in this room. And I'm sure many of you either know someone or have treated many people who have rheumatoid arthritis. It affects nearly 2% of the Australian population. That doesn't sound like a lot of people until you consider that that's actually every human that lives in Canberra and Queanbeyan region. That's a lot of people in this country are suffering from a disease that is extremely, very, very, very difficult to treat and very painful. It is an inflammatory autoimmune disease that's progressive and destructive. Don't for a second fall into the complacency and compare it with osteoarthritis. This is something that cripples your joints. It tears them apart from the inside. Your immune system, your system sees all of the joint linings, the synovial fluid, um, sorry, the, the uh, synovial tissue, the cartilage, the ligaments, the tendons around the joints, all as an enemy. And they all get caught up in an autoimmune process that's very destructive. Okay, so it's terribly debil debilitating for, in, for the sufferer and it genuinely ruins people's lives. I know um, children who have died from this disease. It's something you can get at any age. It's, a, it's called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and there are people who are wheelchair um, bound as a result. Many people after 10 years can't continue their day job. So it's the sort of thing that is a shocker. And this is just an example of someone who's had rheumatoid arthritis. To me, that looks like they've had that probably for 15 to 20 years with not the right approach, obviously. Right. So, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis are on the rise. Now, this is why it's even more important, I believe, to share this story. It's not, it's not necessarily like a great thrill to get up here. It's very confronting for me to talk about a disease, and you'll see some stuff in a minute, that's very, very um, candid. I'm going to show you some stuff about my life that I wish had never happened. So, this stuff isn't the sort of thing that, like, you know, um, you know, it's like so exciting to be like talking about rheumatoid arthritis. It's just that we need to share the sort of things that, that, that can be done with this disease because it's on the rise and what's even more tragic is, oops, I'm going to get this clicker going well. There we go. And this really kind of resonates with this group and one of the reasons I really wanted to give this talk today is because two of the top three largest grossing pharmaceutical drugs right now in the world, you know what they are? First of all is Humira. And then the second biggest selling, well that's the biggest selling drug in the world is Humira. That's for autoimmune conditions. Right? We used to be worried about things like high blood pressure and cholesterol and stuff like that. 
It's autoimmune conditions now. The biggest selling drug by far. And the, the second biggest selling drug is for asthma. But then the third biggest selling drug is Remicade, another autoimmune drug. The total amount of sales between Humira and Remicade combined is eight and a half times in one year, eight and a half times what the total gross box office for Avatar took. And that's the biggest, biggest box office movie of all time. That's in one year. So that's the amount of money that's being made by people who are suffering from crippling diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, lupus, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriasis, um, all of these um, ongoing chronic lifelong diseases. All right, what's what I consider pretty much pathetic right, is that they say there's no known cause to this. I'm speaking to the people who know so much more about this than anyone else in the community. But in the general community, if you just go on any web website, this is I chose a random, the first Google listing for what causes rheumatoid arthritis, the first listing. An established site, the National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases in the US, and their explanation, doctors don't know what the exact cause of rheumatoid arthritis, and then it goes on to say things that may cause rheumatoid arthritis, genes, environment, and hormones, okay? So if you look at your parents and they haven't got it, you live in the farm and you're nothing wrong with your hormones and you think, well, why on earth would they have rheumatoid arthritis? That's what people say. The number one question that I get when people you know, contact me, and I'll tell you why in a minute, uh, about their rheumatoid arthritis is, why did I get this? How did this happen? And this is the kind of information that you get fed by the leading publishing um, organizations. Okay, so what happened with me? Well, it was 2007. I just woke up with some sore feet. Right? Just one day I just woke up and I had some sore metatarsals under one foot. Like, that's weird. I thought I'd left my feet out of the covers from the bed, um, thinking that they must have got cold during the night time. Um, so I went to the doctor when I also started to get in my fingers and I said, Doc, I've got sore feet, sore fingers. He said, well, run a blood test. And he ran the blood test, came back, and it was uh, um, rheumatoid factor positive. And um, he said, what you've got is rheumatoid arthritis. And I'd never heard of it. I had no idea what it was. I didn't know anyone who had it. I'd never seen anyone with it. I knew no one. I didn't even know anything about it. He said it's a degenerative, auto, degenerative autoimmune disease in which the body attacks the lining of the joints. He said you'll probably end up um, on medications forever. Lifelong pain. He said it's all about trying to keep the pain down, but there's no cure. Right? And he went on to say that of all the diseases that he would not want to get, that would be at the top of his list. And I'm like, thanks doctor, you're a legend. I've got to come to you more often, right? Never went back to that guy. Okay, went to the rheumatologist, right? Went to the rheumatologist, didn't know they existed. Okay, went to a rheumatologist, of course, specializes in arthritic conditions, joint diseases. Right, here is the accepted treatment approach from a rheumatologist. In one picture, that's what it is there. Right? That is the approach. Pretty much they have an offering of drugs. I've been told by rheumatologists there's plenty more medications in the cabinet. That's pretty much what they can offer. I talked about, drug, I talked about uh, diet um, with some early meetings. And the response you get is, well, maybe you look at nightshade vegetables. You know, maybe there's something in that. And that's it. And that was from one that said something about diet. The other one said it doesn't have anything to do with rheumatoid arthritis at all. So, they talk about methotrexate, that's their favourite drug, um, and 98% uh, of people with rheumatoid arthritis at some point end up uh, on methotrexate. It used to be a cancer drug, they found uh, that it can help people with autoimmune diseases like methotrex uh, sorry, like rheumatoid, and so that gets pushed pretty hard. And I thought, maybe I'd get well on my own, right? I'd been diagnosed, I only had it for like about two months, it took a month to get a, a rheumatologist visit. So you sit around here thinking, I can beat this, you know, I'm thinking, nobody in my family has a history of rheumatoid arthritis, and I've never been seriously sick in any other way. I mean, I was actually a, um, a cross-country champion. I uh, was really good over a six-kilometre run, and also I was school sports captain, and I was college sports captain. So I was a fit guy. Like, I had no symptoms whatsoever. I woke up one morning and had rheumatoid arthritis. And so I'm thinking, i got to, if anyone can beat this, I can. I'm not old. Like... Most people who get the disease are aged between 40 and 60 when they first get it. And this is going, I'm 37, so this is going back about six years. So, you know, I was 31. And uh, also, um, just for interest's sake, most people who get it are also female. And I thought, look, 
I've got a lot of time on my hands, right? Most people are busy with kids and work in a stressful life. I'm doing stand-up comedy twice a week and I got the rest of the time to myself. Surely I can fix this, okay? So what I did is I took advice from many doctors. I saw a couple of different GPs and I went to a lot of different alternative therapies, probably even some people, uh, some of the colleagues or people in this room. I went to uh, all sorts of things, mineral water baths in Moree. I went swimming in mud in, in Fiji and got zapped every week with electric current by a naturopath. Uh, he used to connect me to a cathode and an anode, one, one end to the other, and then run some micro bio, uh, micro destroying frequency and uh, we tried that for a while. Uh, tried a few supplements here and there, um, nothing too serious at this point, but don't worry, I'll get to them in a minute. Um, tried to eat a little bit better, you know, I thought okay, I better cut down on you know, margarines and all that sort of stuff, no more fast food whatsoever. And I woke up every morning and I was 100% convinced right into my soul that I would wake up one day and it would be gone because I'd read all these positive thinking books and I'm a very, very positive guy. And I thought I could do anything, overcome anything, right? So, after 18 months, I was pretty much crippled, right? That was the result of all that, okay? None of that positive thinking did shit, right? So, I was absolutely in so much pain. It's like having glass, little crumbles of glass in your joints. So that every time you move, it like screams at you. It's just absolutely the worst possible feeling. It's not like any other pain I've ever experienced. So I had it in my chest so that with every movement of my chest, I would get pain. That means every breath. I had it in my jaw so that when I would eat a meal, it would hurt just to chew, okay? I had it so bad in my fingers and wrists that I had to use like my teeth to pull my covers over me like that because I couldn't grasp the doona. My elbows couldn't pull the doona um, over me. So nothing, uh, nothing to uh, underestimate or understate how bad I was in. How bad a state I was in. So I went back to the rheumatologist and I said, you're still selling that methotrexate? <laughs> I wouldn't mind a piece of that gear. So uh, he started me off on 10 milligrams a week of methotrexate, which is actually quite a low dose. And I went to another rheumatologist for a second opinion later and she's like, you got up your dose, 25, let's get you on 25. Anyway, so eventually we went back later on in the piece and I did go up to 25 milligrams. But started off with, uh, with a 10 and six months later, uh, this is where I was at. I had to go in for a surgery uh, on my left elbow. So the methotrexate did reduce my, um, my inflammation probably about 60% for the first couple of months. But I was in such a bad way that I had to have a complete synovectomy on my left elbow, which is the removal of all the soft tissue around the joint. And here I am on a passive continuous motion machine that I had to be on for 10 hours every day for six weeks. I had to try and do comedy in between that, and I would go out, I would perform, I'd come back and spend an extra couple of hours to 1 a.m. in the morning, so I got my 10 hours in. The, the surgeon said it was extremely uh, important, and so I did that, I was very, very adhering to his advice. He also, on parting, parting farewell, said, I'll see you when it's time to do the other arm. Right? So, it's, uh, it's all fun. Um, and so here I was in this machine, and this is about a week or two later, and. Um, what I would have to do when I was doing my comedy work is I used to have to use my knees because um, we've got a mic stand up here. I used to use my knees to then pull the um, pull the mic out of the mic stand because I couldn't actually grab the, the mic stand and remove the, the mic. So that wasn't even the worst of it. I was uh, also dealing with my knee problem. This is how I'm walking, which is not really much of a walk. And uh, here we are in the, let's have a look here, oh look at that, big swollen boy there on the left hand side. Could not walk this morning, today's basically, uh, this morning when I woke up I'm like this is the worst day I've ever had in my life. Um, my knee is so, so bad and so swollen. That it can't support my body weight so I had to get my girlfriend um, who's filming this now because I can't stand to go and set up a set up the uh, the uh, video huge amount of uh, fatigue and and just felt even like I could be sick all around here is just rock hard with synovial fluid that's all gone up also in behind but I can't twist it to show because it hurts too much 
so it's pretty bad shape. So like the elbow's kind of all, elbow's pretty locked up, like that, that's hurting a lot like that, like that, I don't even want to demonstrate that one. This one's sort of, this is the one that's had the operation, it's like, it, if I put that close enough to the camera you could hear that actually clicking. This guy here, I can't form a fist, I can try and get him, but he's hurting now, this little guy won't come down. I can't, I, I'm, I cannot even move my leg to demonstrate how much pain it is to walk because I need my camera girl to actually uh, carry me. So, uh, might leave it there. Okay, needless to say, that's uh, pretty rough. And um, so anyway, so I thought this is, this is bad, right? So what I did is uh, I looked at where my life was at and um, Sorry, I got chronic fatigue from the drugs and I was borderline depression. Um, it was ex excruciating pain, like it's just, the pain is just incredible. So I was rapidly losing all the cartilage. I, I've no cartilage in my left elbow. I'm bare, I've got a, a fraction left in my left knee. Um, and I was losing it in some weird places like on the right foot and underneath the, one of the metatarsals and stuff. And so what got to me though most was that I was told I wouldn't be able to have children while I was on the drugs. You have to be on those uh, drugs for a long period of time because they have a long sort of residency in the body. And so uh, I was with my wife. I had to propose to her without properly getting on one knee because I couldn't. And she was so supportive. And I thought, I have to do something about this. And so I thought, I must get well no matter what. Now, up until that point, I guess the one thing that I probably could say that I hadn't been doing, the one thing I hadn't been doing, was not taking complete and utter ownership over this disease and considering it something that I had to actually, if it was ever gonna get better, I had to take care of it myself, right? If it's meant to be, it's up to me. That's one of the mantras that I gave myself. And I thought, what skills do I have to help myself? And now, in searching for a solution, I looked at my educational background and Paul gave me a wonderful introduction, um, which was uh, quite a long introduction. And in this country, you know, we've got the tall poppy syndrome and we don't like to sort of pump ourselves up too much. But the reality is that I do have a really good educational background. And if you just bear with me for a second, I did uh, teach myself three unit mathematics at school. I got 88% teaching myself out of a textbook because I'm from out near Dubbo and we don't actually have, we didn't in my little school at year, in, in, um, in year 12 at Peak Hill, the school I went to, actually had three unit maths teacher. So I taught myself and I got 88%. Well, that's not too bad. I did laser physics at Macquarie University and I got the highest honours thesis grade ever. Um, I was also published a scientific journal paper in electronic letters at age 22, so I'm familiar with the scientific literature. I was the Young Australian of the Year uh, finalist for science and I got the PSC award and a big check for several thousand dollars for the contribution I did to the industry in the area of optical fibres and lasers and I was awarded the Institute of Physics a prize uh, in New South Wales for that year. And this is going back at my university days, but I thought, if I can do that, then I'm gonna be able to kick some rheumatoid ass. That's what I said to myself. I said, I've gotta bring this on. So my new research project was to understand the real cause of RA and put a stop to it. So I studied 50 scientific papers about rheumatoid arthritis. I looked at a thousand hours, I reckon I spent on the internet. Every day I would just study, 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 looking for connections. I read every book imaginable on rheumatoid arthritis and I found two people only on the internet who'd recovered from rheumatoid arthritis and written about it. Two people in the whole world, okay? And one of them, uh, both of them involved radical changes in diet and one lady is called Sonia Sinclair and she wrote Freedom from Rheumatoid Arthritis. I found, unfortunately, I can't contact Sonia. It's like she's disappeared. I don't know what's happened to her, unfortunately. I've since tried many times, but just can't find any information about Sonia. Um, and then secondly, Conquering Arthritis by Barbara Allen. She's got the number one arthritis best-selling book on Amazon and has done for several years. She's a lovely person and she helped coach me over the phone through several sessions early on when I was at this phase of my um, journey. Now, my new research project uh, was to study the relationship between the digestive system and autoimmune diseases. I figured there has to be a connection because the only two people who've healed themselves have gone down this path. Okay, so, like most great scientific discoveries, they're done by accident. And I had something I now call the cherry incident. I was coming from Orange in central New South Wales and driving to Sydney and I was in, in the car and I had, um, had to stop, I was starving. So I pulled out, I went into a Woolworths and I got myself some, some cherries. They were imported from the US 
and uh, they were not washed. And I thought, it'll be fine, you know, I'm from the bush, I can tolerate it, no problem, right? So I sit in the car and I munch all these cherries driving from Orange back to Sydney. That night I started to get some indigestion and I actually then vomited and was, had diarrhea for 24 hours after that. It was just food poisoning and there was something, pesticide or something on the cherries. When you have rheumatoid arthritis, it's critical to keep moving all the time. The joints have got to keep moving because the joints themselves don't get blood flow. They need the compression and movement from the synovial fluid to actually nurture the joints. So I was terrified because I thought, I'm lying in bed and I'm not moving because I can't. I'm vomiting and having diarrhea. When I get out of this situation, I'm just, I can't even imagine how bad my body's going to feel. But quite the opposite, after I'd purged my body top and bottom, I felt fantastic. I'm like, what the? Bloody hell, what's going on here? So I rang my wife the next day at work and I said, you won't believe it. I've gotten out of bed and I can walk without a limp. The swelling's tremendously lower in my knee. I can move my elbows a lot more. And I thought, something is going on with the digestive process, big time, right? I thought all I need to do now is just work out how I can get the same results without having to vomit and diarrhea for the rest of my life, right? And so I started conducting huge experiments. I went heavy into juicing and raw foods. And this is where some people say, you've got to be nuts to do what you did next. For the next eight months, I lived off raw foods. I spent my entire time drinking green juices, wheatgrass shots, buying groceries that looked like that. That was our sort of daily or second day. Uh, uh, whoops. Sorry, I just flipped to a couple there. Um, and so it was just green, 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 green. And for my calories, I was living off soaked almonds, right? So I'd soak them eight hours prior to activate them because that will create 10 to 100 times the amount of enzymes in the almond. And also soaked macadamia nuts and soaked pumpkin seeds. And I lived off that. I call that the chimpanzee diet. And uh, I was doing that with that for eight months, right? And I incorporated some of Barbara Allen's strategies and I got like 80% better. I was pulling CRP, um, C-reactive protein, blood uh, inflammation levels, kind of like three and four, right? So I was in the normal range, but I wasn't totally sort of where I wanted to be. And so then I slowly transitioned after I read some more books, and I'll show you these extra books in a minute that I read. And I read more about the importance of, um, of, of low protein cooked foods so then I moved to alkalizing cooked foods, and I moved on to a bunch of supplements. I'll tell you about in a second, and I exercise like a crazy person. So I moved into things like sweet potatoes uh, soup, really easy to digest and break down, um, pumpkin soups. I moved into an original creation, which was a combination of just buckwheat and quinoa, and I'd eat that with um, leafy, um, uh, not always eat that with some salad. Um, and then also, that's a different picture of something similar, which has um, also uh, got some sweet potato in there. And then I moved into a little bit more aggressive, if you look at like from a point of view of alkalizing and so forth, um, into the uh, seaweed, and that's um, just some dulcy seaweed mixed in with some brown rice. And then I went into some what I consider aggressive eating, which is the uh, brown rice and some black beans, all right? That for me was like ultimate delicious after you're going through eight months of chimp diet. So after that, I then, I was, sorry, throughout that whole time, I was taking supplements like crazy. So I think I've got the entire industry covered um, in here from the top, from B vitamins right down to zinc and chondroit. And then, like, I don't, hopefully I haven't left anyone out. I'm sorry if I have. Um, but I probably single-handedly helped everyone double their profits in 2010. Um, in fact, I think I spent so much money, and I think it's going to get to the point where one day I'm going to be broke and I'll be walking around the streets like, oh, mate, have you got a few cents for a multi? Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a bit like that. So anyway, I, I went through all that, and I'll tell you in a second which ones I believe had the biggest impact on me. I exercise like crazy, and I believe the single best exercise on the planet for someone with a crippling disease or a knee problem is Bikram Yoga. It's very unpleasant. I've done 571 classes. I hated every second of it. But it was so, that's how much benefit I got, because it's so hard, especially when you can barely stand on one leg. So, that's what I did, and finally, after two years of that, I got results. So, I was able to, previously on methotrexate, I got off of all my drugs. I haven't taken drugs now for two years. Uh, I got my fingers 
from this back down to this. Yeah, then we also saw that I got um, asked to be an ambassador for Arthritis New South Wales. Um, the timing was perfect with me performing at their events and they heard my story and they're like, we need you. So I got involved with those, that great organisation. <laughs> And they put me on the cover of their magazine. I'm up there with another gentleman, and he's um, on more of a conventional um, sort of what we talked about at the start of the talk with regards to um, some pharmaceuticals that have helped him a lot as well. So this is the first time yeah. I ran in four years back out yeah. where I proposed to my wife. <laughs> Go, honey! Yeah! <laughs> uh, that was pretty incredible. Uh, to go from where I was to running is pretty much, I, you know, like, I don't know how hard it is to climb Mount Everest, but look, I, um, I would have swapped. I would have taken on that challenge because that was very difficult. Now, here's my belief and approach, and I know we're right on five, so I'm going to go quickly now. Got to heal the gut first like everyone in this room knows, but no one in the scientific community knows that. Just like you guys in ancient Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine, you've got to heal the gut. What's happening is circulating immune complex has been formed in the bloodstream as a result of particles, proteins, getting in through a leaky gut, entering in the bloodstream, and they create um, circulating immune complexes as the antigen is combined with an antibody, and they can get lodged into the joints and trigger an inflammatory reaction. So, I coined the acronym BLAME, which addresses the five, I believe, most critical aspects of treating rheumatoid arthritis. Bacteria, because we've got two kilos of bacteria in a healthy body, which fights against pathogens and fights against bad bacteria, um, produces B vitamins for your energy levels and all these sort of things. Very critical to establishing the communication from the blood to the other side of the intestinal wall and, and pretty much influencing how the immune system works. I was terribly low on bacteria. I'd taken antibiotics for several years because of acne when I was a teenager, and I believe that was one of the biggest reasons that I developed rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, leaky gut, we all know about this. Uh, everyone knows in this room what leaky gut is. Um, acidosis, a chronic state of being too acidic from eating crap foods all the time, from being stressed out all the time, and I'll talk about that in a second. Mucosal lining, the area that protects that single cell intestinal wall uh, and allows it to allow, and, and digest the uh, nutrients as the food is traversing through the intestine. And when you have a damaged mucosal lining, then the, the, uh, the intestinal wall is exposed for particles to be able to get through to the bloodstream, which are too large and should continue down their path. Finally, enzyme, what I consider the most overlooked part of nutrition. Is there anyone in the room who sells digestive enzymes. Thank you. Thank you so much because I've used so many digestive enzymes over the years and I consider them an essential part towards my healing. In particular, I used bromelain and papain or combinations of proteolytic enzymes and they were instrumental to my healing. Okay, what causes the blame? Long-term medications, all right? non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs which are told to be used to patients by doctors cause leaky gut, right? So we're getting told to take this shit. And not only that is I was also told in the first consultation with my rheumatologist to experiment with some antibiotics as well. They found that there's a relationship that there seems to be in some cases an improvement for patients when they take antibiotics. And that's because Antibiotics are like monkey with a machine gun. It just gets in there and shoots everything. And so, yeah, it might be taking out some of the bad bacteria that's, that's not allowing the gut to heal and you inadvertently see some improvement of the patient. But it's not a good strategy. Stress, all right, takes blood away from the digestive process. They also did a study where they showed that in the States they did a study on these students who were pre-exam, just before they took an exam. A week before the exam, they were not st stressed. Their fecal bacteria levels were very high. They had lots of healthy bacteria. During the week of their exams, their fecal bacteria was less than 50%. Healthy bacteria suffers when you're under stressful conditions. So to heal the gut, to heal RA, you have to get rid of the stress. Processed and acidifying foods, these completely deplete the body of, of enzymes which are needed to break down the foods to protect those big protein particles getting through the gut wall. Not only that, Coca-Cola, it's got a pH of 3 which is 10 
thousand times more acidic than water. Every time that's going into the body, it's completely acidifying. The entire liquid, liquid component of our body making it even harder to heal from chronic disease. Now, the final two, meat and dairy products. And this is where the talk can be a little bit confronting for people. They don't want to hear about having to stop eating meat and dairy. But when you're in a critical state and you're sort of suicidal, you don't care what you have to give up. And this is really easy for people to give up when they're struggling from something so chronic as rheumatoid arthritis. Now, I'll talk about both these two in the next slide. So I'll fly through this and say, when all these things occur consistently, then disease can manifest in an area that you're predisposed to. So I think this is where the hereditary part comes in. I think it's not with regards to getting the disease. It's about having a genetic predisposition, which never needs to actually manifest itself unless you do all of these stupid things with your life on Earth. Okay, why no meat and dairy? Well, uh, the scientific studies uh, done on rheumatoid arthritis, uh, one with a 38-year-old mother, she went off dairy products and basically um, she was able to maintain her improvement completely until she uh, ate it again and then she got her symptoms back immediately. Okay, another experiment, they got all these people with rheumatoid arthritis off dairy products. Out of 15 patients, seven went into remission just by coming off dairy. The reason is casein, it's the protein in dairy. It looks exactly like one of the protein combinations of amino acids in your joints. When you stop eating dairy products, you dramatically improve your condition of rheumatoid arthritis. This is especially important for children. People with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis as a child, so someone who has a child with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, you cannot get them off milk quick enough. It's shocking. All right. A comparison was made between uh, cow's milk, egg protein, and soy, and they found that egg protein and milk was the worst. And I'll fly through these now. Meat, uh, they believe that there's a direct relationship between the meat proteins and rheumatoid arthritis as well. In fact, they said it's the highest dietary link to RA symptoms. And I'm sorry I don't have the study. I can produce the studies to anyone who wants to see them afterwards. Um, and, um, okay, I'll just move along because I know we're over time. Okay, they believe that it's so, the connection is so strong, they've done studies on a meat-induced joint attack. There's a theory about these meat proteins in the body. It's about the, it's about the concept of molecular mimicry and the body seeing these invading proteins as its own self. All right, and even within your industry, I attended the Metagenic seminar recently. Some people may have actually went to it. Lawrence gave a fantastic talk about this, and he even has in his book excessive animal protein, some simple sugars, gluten, and casein go on to create a bacteria, metabolites, takes them from a beneficial to a toxic one. You don't want to be eating anything that's going to take you to a toxic bacteria in the gut. Okay, so Dr. Shinya, uh, he talks about this in, the, in his work. I recommend anyone to read anything by Dr. Shinya. Uh, he's got a book called The Enzyme Factor. And he's looked at 350,000 intestinal tracts of people over his career. He said, no one who eats dairy on a regular basis has a healthy colon. All right? Maybe something to think about. Um, it happens to also, if you eliminate uh, meat and dairy products, you'll also happen to get rid of heart disease. If anyone's interested in that. No. Um, you can reverse diabetes, the same low-fat, vegan approach. Um, and uh, in this study, um, this is a huge study, but in one of those they took experimental mice and they gave them cancer and then they added casein to their chow. The cancer rate increased and they removed casein and the cancer went away again. They add casein back in there. There's nothing good about the dairy products. Dr. McDougall, one of my heroes, talks about this at great length in his books, The McDougall Program, Start Solution and many more. What about protein, iron and calcium? Well, protein is actually the problem for most people with rheumatoid. You only, you only need much less protein than we actually think. I've always been skinny. I'm not skinny like this because I don't eat protein. I'm at a similar weight to what I was before I got this disease and I was eating like a champion. Um, anemia, people like, what about the iron? Well, anemia in RA sufferers is actually due to anemia of chronic disease. You treat the inflammation, the anemia goes away. Right? Calcium is lost from the bones from dairy products, not gained. Research all the books I was talking about earlier. I'm sure at least 50% of the people in this room know that the countries who consume the highest rate of uh, dairy products actually have the highest rates of osteoporosis and osteoarthritis, okay? So 
I don't know if I... All right, I've got to go over, Paul. I'm going to wrap up. No? Okay, it's all right. Um, there's nothing missing from a plant-based approach. I did put vitamin B12 there. I get that from seaweed. You can get up and breathe them on each other, whatever you want. All right. <laughs> Glad you're still with me. Is this interesting to people? Is it good? Yeah? Okay, good, good, good. I know, I know, I'm sorry. A successful approach to treating RA, we've got to have low fat. For some reason, people with rheumatoid arthritis can't break down their fat. Lipase, I tried taking that as a supplement, try to break down the fat. Can't seem to break down the vegetable oils. So even things like olive oil and, um, and flaxseed oil, these things just don't seem to go through without creating inflammation. That's why the meat and dairy bags, they're high in fat and they're high in protein. Scientific studies show that the fat increases gut permeability and personal and anecdotal experience um, should be no vegetable oils. Um, Plant-based elimination diets, what we need to do is get people on an elimination diet so that they don't actually have many things in their diet so that at the end, so that then they can test things back in one at a time. High in potassium is very important, 98% of us don't get enough potassium. It's a critical um, uh, part of the cortisone production within people with RA. Within everyone actually, but people with RA have depleted cortisone. When you add potassium, their own natural cortisone levels go back up and they're able to get natural pain relief. So that's a study that was done only in the last two years. And that, for me, was one of the big breakthroughs. 100% alkalizing, rich in raw foods for enzymes, rich in leafy greens for alkalization, high in C, and vitamin D because of its involvement in the, uh, in the autoimmune process. Okay, lots of strength building exercises. So now I've been helping others, I've put all this together in the Patterson Program for Rheumatoid Arthritis, and we have now solved this, my wife and I, in 49 countries um, all around the world, and we've had some incredible success stories, changed the lives of many, many people. Um, we have uh, people who basically say, you know, to be precious in pain, you know, I basically, I can't believe it, wake up with no pain, I'm just going to fly through these. I literally have hundreds of these, hundreds. Okay, like look at this guy's just gone from CRP 38 down to 5.6, and I've only picked a few here. My inflammation's gone down, I say, my almost disappeared. And what about someone like Linda, who's had like RA? for 25 years. What about someone like her? I rang her son, and, uh, her son and his girlfriend the other day to check on her after she'd been following the program. Anyway, so we got through the program. Um, her energy levels went through the roof. Um, she walked into town. She walked into town, which is pretty... Right. And was she not... <laughs> she wasn't walking before that? She wouldn't walk two places, no. She walked into town. Um, and only yesterday, she came to see me yesterday, came to see us, um, and uh, she's on about buying new pairs of trainers to walk around the block once a day. Wow. Now that mom is, is huge. Wow. All right, so what about supplementation? Here we go. So this is what I believe. It's David versus Goliath. If you're a naturopath in the room and you're treating someone with RA, if they don't change their diet, They've got no chance, all right? They just aren't ever going to get well and the statistics support that, okay? It, you, the supplementation helps a lot, but the diet has such an, a, a, an opposite effect if they're eating poorly. So having said that, there are some, some considerations for sufferers of RA and all of these I fully endorse and recommend in my book. Potassium, not just for pH balance, but also for cortisol production. And as I understood from people in this room who I've learned from, and your colleagues, it's important to take the magnesium. Um, digestive enzymes, very important. Um, hydrochloric acid levels in most people with RA is too low. And in fact, people over the age of 65, I think something like 35% of people over 65 have no hydrochloric acid production. And so it's essential to break down the proteins which are causing so much trouble. Okay, non-dairy probiotics for obvious reasons, natural anti-inflammatories, I get a lot of anecdotal stories coming back about curcumin, which I used for a period of time. Vitamin D, and I think Lawrence, who I mentioned earlier, who gave the talk for Metagenics, reckons that the four immune conditions of vitamin D should be well over 100. I think the minimum is like 40. I think way over 100 is necessary to really start to get a good result. And then all the antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal herbs, I think are fabulous. Okay, so my final thoughts, anything is possible in life. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with. It doesn't matter if it's a business challenge or whether or not it's a personal challenge or whether or not it's a spiritual challenge or whatever it might be. You can do anything. And it doesn't matter what people say. You just got to get out there and give it a shot. 
Also, never underestimate your own abilities. Just because the masses might say one thing, if you know something in your heart, and you know that it can be, you've got this, this nagging thing, but you know better, go for it. That's the truth. The truth is not what other people tell you, it's what you know in your heart. So, rheumatoid arthritis, like all disease, I believe begins in the gut. And I applaud everyone in the room because you guys know this and are treating it that way. I will continue to help others with autoimmune diseases and if there's anyone in the room who would like to, you know, talk with me about how we can work together, um, then I think this is the perfect opportunity to do so and I'll be here involved with the uh, dinner tonight, not talking about disease, I promise. Um, and uh, I'd love to be a part of anything that anyone would like to, to work with me on or, or to talk about. And finally, there is hope. And this is a word that you constantly get, I get from customers all the time. They just wanted hope because there's so lack of hope when you have a chronic autoimmune condition. And there's hope not just for the people out there who, who are now finding some information that's been very, very useful and life changing, particularly in third world countries. But it's also hope for me and my wife because I've now been off the drugs for two years and one of the biggest motivators for me was to try and start a family. And my parents don't know this, but we are just a week or two shy from being three months pregnant and it's just going to be the most loved baby. It's going to be the most cherished, the most looked after baby on the planet, um, but it won't be getting dairy products. <laughs> right. Thank you very much everyone, I appreciate it.